Good morning, everybody. You are tuned in to Jesus and Coffee Time right here on 980 WCAP. I'm your host, Ashley Elizabeth. You can come and join me every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. right here for an inspirational hour. We unpack the national news from a biblical perspective. We give you the facts, and then we also have an uplifting, inspirational story of the week and a time of devotion in God's Word. Well, I'm so glad that you're here today. Our main topic of what's in the news has to do with vaccines. Um, This is one of the largest things that a lot of people are talking about right now. You know, questions, you know, such as, should I take the vaccine? Is it safe for me? Is it safe for my family? What happens if I don't take the vaccine? If I do, are there side effects? There's a lot going on with this. So that's what we're going to unpack this morning. So I want to invite my husband, Justin, to come on and join me. Good morning, Justin. Good morning. Happy spring. Happy spring. (laughs) Now we just need all the nice weather, although it's been starting. It has been starting. So I'm thankful for that. It's nice to see. It is nice to see. So in regard to vaccines, so there's three vaccines that are approved in the U.S. There's Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. And as I said, there's a wide range of opinions on these COVID vaccines. And so just to give you some quick information, to date, over 120 million people have been vaccinated here in the US and over 430 million people have been vaccinated worldwide. The number one country to vaccinate so far is Israel. They've vaccinated 55% of their population. The United States is fifth in the world as percentage of total population vaccinated. Um, So just to kind of give you the quick list, so Israel's number one, followed by the United Arab Emirates, Chile, the UK, and then the US. Um, And the fact about that, the reason why um, we see that is because we, we basically in the US, we vaccinate twice as many people as the next nearest country. I think it's China. It was China's done about 60, 65 million. Right. And the difference there is is really due to the um, entire entirety of its population, um, the size of the population. So, Justin, can you talk to that quickly and then we'll get into uh, more about the vaccines? Yeah. Like you said, the U.S., the well, population in the U.S. is somewhere between the last time I, I think it was 335, 345 million. And it, uh, at least 120 million people in the U.S. have gotten at least one shot because the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are two shot vaccines. Some of them have gotten Johnson & Johnson, but it's not widely distributed. Um, but as a percentage of the population, it's less than those other countries you mentioned because they're smaller. They have obviously less of a population, so it's easier to do. It's still difficult, but it's easier. Um, so even though the U.S. is doing it, we've done so many, we account for almost a quarter of the world's vaccinations. Our population is so large that it's taking a little bit more time. We're still going real quick. I mean, right now we're vaccinating somewhere between 2.5, around 2.5 million people a day, which is very fast. Um, it's projected to get up to 3 million a day sometime in April. Um, and I think the president had said there should be enough supply uh, to for every adult to be able to get a vaccination by May, which is a few months earlier than before. Um, and he had made a pledge to do 100 million vaccinations in his first 100 days in office, and they passed that before the 60th day. So now his goal is to get 200 million vaccinations in the first 100 days. So we'll see if they get there. They're on track for it. If they keep pushing at the rate they're at, we might actually reach the 200 million mark in his first 100 days in office. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So what we want to cover, we're going to give you a rundown so that we can understand vaccines. Um, You know, what are they? How do they work? What's the technology behind them? How effective are they? And then we are also going to talk about acceptance rates um, as well as the rollout. You know, there are some people who... Um, kind of have it set in their mind that they don't want to take this. So we mm. want to talk about and maybe dispel some of those reasons why um, and, and give facts. So let's get started, Justin, with talking about these three vaccines. Could you give us a general description, um, like quality and, and the used methods behind them, the technology? Sure. Thanks. Sure. So like you said, there's three vaccines currently approved in the U.S., Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. Now, there are others around the world. I'm sure a lot of people have seen stuff in the news about AstraZeneca vaccine and blood clots and stuff. Well, that is not used in the U.S. Um, It's only approved in Europe um, and places like Canada and Mexico. In fact, the U.S. had a supply, and the president shipped it to Mexico and Canada because they use it to help them out. Um, But we're only using these three. So to get into them... Moderna and Pfizer use a brand new type of vaccination technology called mRNA or messenger RNA technology. It's new in the sense that it's never been approved before. But at the same time, the technology itself is several decades old. And it's been 
championed um, as a way to far more quickly create far more targeted medicines than in the past. I'm not, I'm not an epidemiologist, but from what I've learned from doing some research, the typical way you do vaccines, and this is the method that Johnson & Johnson uses, the traditional way, is that scientists will isolate the virus and they'll take the dangerous parts of the virus out. They'll kind of neuter it in a way. So it's very, it's much less potent. And then they'll inject it into you after doing some processing so that your body will accept it and it will learn what it is and learn how to fight it, but it won't overcome you so you don't get sick. That's why so many vaccines that we use today, you get the injection, you might get a headache or feel a little run down for a couple of days. And we'll talk about the side effects with these. And that's how the traditional ones work. Right? So that's to build up antibodies exactly. in your body. Exactly. Sure. And that's that's the Johnson & Johnson one. It uses one shot, like a lot of the traditional vaccines we've seen. These mRNA ones, by contrast, they the scientists basically take RNA, which is a part of your DNA. It's the method by which the body produces proteins, encodes proteins, and not protein as in like food type of protein, but what the body is made up of, how cells work. And the body naturally does this. It teaches proteins to do things when you need to heal, when you need to, when kids are growing, things of that nature. They make their own RNA, so it's synthetic, and they tell it and te to teach the cell how to produce antibodies to defeat COVID. And then they figure out a way to inject it into you, and it goes and it teaches your immune system cells, and there's various kinds, but it teaches the right cells how to fight the vaccine. It, it's literally, that's why it's called messenger. It's literally fight, a message. How to fight the virus, I'm sorry, not how the to vaccine. Fight the virus. Right. Sure, just wanted exactly. to clarify that. How to fight the virus. And it's produced very quickly because once the genetic code of the virus was sequenced, which happened very fast, and scientists were, they can literally plug it into a computer, and a computer will tell them, this is the, the messenger RNA that you need to be able to encode cells to fight the virus. So like Moderna was able to produce their vaccine in 42 days, which was insanely fast. I mean, in the past, the traditional way is so slow because you have to test one variation after another, after another, after another, because you're using the virus itself. You have to make it less dangerous. You have to figure out which one works. And that's literally growing Petri dishes in a lab. This was all computers. So that's why it's so quick. It's revolutionary. And it's been around, like I said, it's been around for over 40 years. But I do think it's important we're talking about this because there is a hesitation mm -hmm. with a large group of people who feel, well, this moved too quickly and I don't want to be injected with something that hasn't been tested on. And sure. Right. How could it happen so fast? So I think it's important. Oh, definitely. We, we it's learn definitely about how this works. Definitely important to understand. And so that's a consequence of the technology. Just like 30 years ago, computers weren't what they were. This is the same thing. And to talk about testing for a second, each one of these vaccines had to go through the typical three-stage trial system that vaccines use. There's an initial study, phase one, where they study the vaccine very early. They get some initial results. Then they do a phase two study, and then they move into a phase three. Phase three involves vaccinating a lot of people. In this case, Moderna vaccinated 30,000 people. Pfizer vaccinated 44,000 people. And Johnson & Johnson vaccinated 40,000 people. And then you study the effect. And they do control groups. So like they give people a placebo, but they don't tell who gets what and they study it. And that's why they're able to draw conclusions on the safety and whatever. And then the government, the FDA looks at it and determines that the safety is there. They move on. Um, and so that's, they met all those benchmarks. And yes, it's emergency authorization. It didn't go through the full testing um, sure. by the government because of the danger of COVID. But that doesn't mean that it's unsafe. It has, still has to meet certain benchmarks, which we'll get to when we get to the side effects side. Of and it. is there a generally rated effectiveness for these vaccines? There is, um, and which takes a little explaining because there are different terms that the scientists use. Effectiveness means like how it generally. Let me back up. So, like when you read like Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, they're rated at ninety-five percent effective. That means generally. 95 out of every, there should be, 95 out of, every, out of every 100 people should avoid being sick. So only, there should be only be five people who still get sick out of 100 who got the vaccine. Johnson & Johnson's a little bit less. It's at 72% effectiveness. Same kind of idea, right? But what is it effective for? When these vaccines were made and the benchmarks that the government gave them, it was to prevent symptomatic infection 
and severe illness, hospitalization, and death. So that's what they were made for. They weren't made to capture every single type of infection. And the the variants that we're seeing and things like that. Well, that's a totally different... Yeah, the variants are a big issue because there weren't any when these testing regimes for the vaccination started, and we'll get to that. But the effectiveness, for people to understand, it's towards symptomatic illness and infection and then hospitalizations and deaths. So it's 95% effective in blunting that. But that's not everything. We know there's asymptomatic infection. We know there's other things. So for people out there who might have seen, well, you know, there's still people getting sick. That happens. No vaccine is 100% effective. Even the the best vaccines we've ever found for the measles, mumps, and rubella, it's 97% effective. But when you combine that with 95% of kids in this country still get that vaccination, it essentially eradicates a disease because the you know, so many people have it and it's so effective, it creates basically a zero number. And so with this, not even this Johnson & Johnson, even if that was the only vaccine we had at 72% effectiveness, according to the numbers, if you get at least 75 or 80% of your population vaccinated, it will slowly eradicate the disease because there's not enough hosts. Makes it's like sense. anything else. Sure. When there's too many hosts, that's where variants come from. And we'll, we'll get to that, but that's that's kind of the flip side of that. Okay. And then I know side effects. That's Mm. also a a large um, talking point for people. Yes. You know, and and I think, you know, people's bodies can respond differently. Mm -hmm. And so we've even seen some cases where some people have died, but it's such a small percentage. It is. But the thing is, though, that one that one off two off case gets really highlighted Mm -hmm. in the media and then it kind of creates a bit of a panic frenzy. So can we talk to side effects? Certainly. Okay. And, and like I said before, that gets back to the effectiveness. Effective, and effectiveness at what? At preventing symptomatic infection and severe illness, hospitalization, and death. That was what these vaccines were for. And so even the 95% effective ones are going to leave, on average, five people out of every 100 might still get sick. And when you've only vaccinated in this, uh, you said 120 million people in the U.S. have gotten at least one shot. That's basically one out of every six. So one out of every six Americans has gotten at least one shot, has at least some protection. That's still a lot of people. So even if 95% of those people can't get sick, won't get sick, won't transmit it, because that's the other thing they found with these. They didn't, um, just to step back a sec, there was no effort to make the vaccines anti-transmission, to stop transmission of COVID. Um, but they've done it anyway. They've The vaccines do it just by the way they're made, which is wonderful. I mean, that for, as far as the doctors are concerned, that's an amazing extra feat. And they're just as effective at towards transmissibility as they are about infection. So that's great. But you're still only talking about one out of six. There's still such a large group of people who are sick, could be sick, that it's a race, right? To get enough people vaccinated to overcome the amount of people who aren't. So to get back to side effects, um, as I'm sure, you know, we all know, there are always side effects to medicines a lot of times and vaccinations and different things. Here, the general side effects are the same that you see for a lot of them, right? Injection site soreness is number one, headache, fever, muscle ache, soreness, fatigue. Um, From what I understand, those are extremely common with vaccines because the vaccines, they supercharge your immune system. And so your immune system's working, it's doing things, it's making your body strong, it's getting your body ready to fight a certain sickness, or maybe you get sick and you have the vaccine And so that means the vaccine is helping your body fight it off so you don't really have any great symptoms, but you still feel something. That's all related to why people feel that way after they've been injected with a vaccine. Interesting, because vaccines are usually one shot or two shot, almost always. It's not something you take every month. It's not something you take over the long term. Doctors have never seen any long-term side effects of vaccines. Um, And I know we'll get to the whole autism thing. Right, that kind of leads to a lot of these anti-vaccination ideas, which we'll get to. But in terms of all these, oh, could there be long-term side effects? We'll see what happens in three months, six months. Those don't exist with vaccines because it's a one-shot thing. And your body learns from it, and it's gonna, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen right away. And so the, the side effects that you see, muscle site, um, site, site injection soreness, muscle soreness, headache fatigue. Chills. Chills, mm. the usual stuff. The only thing that really sets the COVID vaccinations apart is that the incidences of this are slightly higher than we've seen for some other vaccinations of the past. 
85% of people who have gotten the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines, I haven't seen any numbers for Johnson & Johnson yet, but 85% of vaccine, people who have received it report some type of side effect. They're almost always mild, but the Moderna vaccine does show 16% of people get moderate side effects. Moderate is classified as something that will like negatively interfere with your daily living. So like it's a headache enough where you have to lay down. It's fatigue enough where you can't, you shouldn't drive a car, stuff like that. And so people who get the Moderna vaccines are advised to uh, not work that day, get somebody to drive you, so on and so forth. Well, I remember before we went to Uganda for our last missions trip before the, the lockdown, mm-hmm. we actually got back, I think it was the end of January. Yeah. And and then everything came out in March. Yep. Um, we actually saw some people with masks on the plane as we were traveling through Schiphol and some other um, mm-hmm. airports. I remember. But I, I remember before we went, we had to get all these vaccines. We had to get yellow fever. I forget what else we had to get. Um, typhoid. Was it typhoid? It was typhoid. It was yellow fever. There was a few. Hepa- one of the hepatitis. I think it was hepatitis B. Yeah. Um, and something else. And then we also had to take malaria pills. Right. When we were there. Right. So a- anyways, all that to say, you know, we, we ended up getting three or four vaccines in our arms, um, one shot. And mm. I remember I was tired. You know, I oh, went yeah. home. I laid down. I had a little bit, you know, of, of chills. I felt a little feverish. I felt I had these like flu-like symptoms, but they eventually passed. They so did. it wasn't anything, you know, when I look at how wonderful the trip was and all that God did during that trip and mm. just the experiences that we had, it was awesome. It was nothing in comparison to that, you know, okay, I was tired for a day. I had a little bit of a fever. I had some chills, you know, it just, I was fatigued. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's just normal. It is normal. It's nothing to really be afraid of, in my opinion. I agree with you. And, and like I said, that's the body's immune system's natural response to being supercharged, essentially, by what the vaccination does, which is why people 65 and older tend not to really have side effects. And if they do, they're almost always mild because their immune systems are naturally weaker because they're older than younger people. I see. So it's really the 55 and younger group that reports moderate more more than mild, so moderate to, you know, um, side effects. It's the people 55 and younger. 65 and older, almost never. Interesting. Because their immune systems are just weaker. It's, it's just a fact of life. Well, Nana's been vaccinated. Mm-hmm. My Nana got vaccinated. Yes, She's yep. had both of her shots, mm-hmm. and she just had a little bit of fatigue. Right. That was it. She's like, my arm is sore. I have some fatigue. I just kind of laid down for a couple hours, but I'm okay. I remember mm-hmm. she said that, and I was glad. I'm yeah, like, well, oh, for praise, sure. Praise God for that. It's exactly. So. And your mom. She has got one shot, and I think her only report was injection site soreness. That's true. And she's just turned 65. 65, And right. so she's right on that line. And so so that's that's all natural. And like you said, we've seen this with vaccines since they've been around. So I guess the question is then, why do we see a lot of people who are afraid mm. of this shot, of these vaccines? I think... The, the biggest thing is misinformation and disinformation. I mean, again, it's going to make me sound political, but all you see is anti-vaccine stuff on Fox News. All you see is anti-vaccine stuff being pushed by a lot of segments, right? And of, of the political sphere, the media sphere. And on the flip side, the government until recently didn't do a great job of informing people. Well, even former President Trump, he actually, him and his wife and his family, they were vaccinated. In January. Right. Which we found out a few weeks ago, and only, it was only this past week that he came out publicly and said, oh yeah, you know, I support people who support me getting vaccinated, especially people who have underlying issues, and hopefully that, that helps. I know all the other former uh, living presidents have already done ad campaigns and things, but he, he stepped up to the plate with that in this past week, which is good to see. Yeah, I think it's just been a big awareness thing, and, and that's why we it always is. say check your facts and where you're getting your information from, um, because it honestly it scares people. Some of the things that we see and we hear scare people. Oh, of course. Like, like without... one, one person dies and it gets blown up out of proportion, but millions and millions of mm-hmm. vaccines have been given. So, I mean, the percentage is not, it's not like 50% of the population are experiencing this. Right. It's one person, two people, you and, know? And the perfect test case is Israel, because they've already vaccinated almost 60% of their population. I think... Literally, like almost all of their 60 and older population have gotten two doses. Like it's like over 90 percent. 
And they've been doing it. They started before the U.S. The U.S. started, I think, in December. They started, I want to say, in November. Do you remember how many cases they had of people experiencing things? It, it was again, low. Again, it was hundreds. I don't I have the specific number, but you're talking like... I think like, it was a few hundred or like something. Like far less than 1%. Yeah. Out of what their population's like 6 to 8 million, something like that. Um, so they're the perfect test case because they're months ahead of us and they vaccinated far more people as a percentage than we have. Uh, and you haven't seen any of that. That's right. Uh, but, you, you know, like you said, the, the hesitancy and the people thinking about side effects and stuff. And I can understand that. It's so easy. To, this is very technical stuff. And me, you know, not being a doctor, despite, you know, how much I love to research and learn things. Doctor like, of the law. Well, yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe. But like not, not the medicine side of it. The mRNA stuff, it's complicated. It's difficult. It's really, really advanced. It's not how they used to do it, right? It's all brand new. So I can totally understand why, you know, for a lot of people, it's just difficult to grasp because it is. That's just the nature of it. So it's easy to be misinformed. It's easy to think. I know one of the big talking points is that it rewrites your DNA. Well, it doesn't. It, it teaches your cells, certain cells in your body, how to fight a virus in a manner more efficient than the old way of just giving it a neutered virus and here, you're going to get sick, but you're not going to feel any side effects. And this is how you learn. This tells them like a computer. I remember what that statistic was. So it was only a few hundred hmm. people in Israel got COVID. So they were contracted it after getting the vaccine. Okay. That's what it was. And that's a very, very low percentage mm -hmm. in relation to how many people have been vaccinated. Right. So you're talking close to 4 million people. At this sure. Point. So I just wanted to clarify that right. it was a few hundred. So that's not bad at all. So for the hesitancy, just for some numbers. Um, when people really started talking about vaccines and the idea was these vaccines are coming back in October, November, December, in the U.S., um, polls, it was an average of 44% of Americans were hesitant to, I'm not taking it at all. And that's a, that's a big number. That is a big number. That's a really big number. And so um, that number has dropped now to less than 25%. So that's great because according to the consensus among doctors is that you're going to need about 80% of the population vaccinated to get rid of COVID. So we're, right te we're teetering on that line of, you know, because that means 20% does and 80% does. And so 23%, that's great. I mean, that's half of what it was. But it's still it's a decent number. And having looked at a lot of polls by Pew, by Washington Post, by NPR, the numbers seem to look like um, the highest percentage group that is not interested and taking the virus, I'm sorry, the vaccine, 50% of conservative-leaning white men, so half of them, 37% um, of Latinos, that was a high number. However they characterize Latino, I don't know, what the, but that's generally like that. 37% um, of all Americans under 45, which I think is tied to like age, you know, that whole either I don't need it or I'm not going to get sick or I've already been sick, I'm young, what, what do Her I care? Herd immunity. Yeah, whatever, like all <laughs> that sure. stuff. Like, um, sure. Is that... And, and I think what's really, however, the like really kind of important for the church is that almost 40% of this kind of like amorphous group of evangelical Christians, that, that's a big number. I and mean, we looked it up. There are 100 million, quote unquote, evangelical Christians in the United States. And this is apparently people who identify as white. So they make up about 25% of the total country's population. That's that's about almost, yeah, right? just about 25% of wow. the total country. So that's all evangelicals of all Races and however you want to characterize them, just all of them. Those who identify as white, that's 75% of that number. So you're talking about 75 million people. And of that number, nearly 40%, so you're talking 25 million, 30 million-ish, won't take it. That, that is, is also a big number. And that obviously, that, yeah, that's talking about people who identify as churchgoers, you know, faith-based people, who, you know, and all that. And so that, I think, when we get talking about, like, how does this really, you know, the biblical perspective talking about the church that's a big number that's an important number that's a big group that, that's a huge number that's a huge number right and i, I wonder why well, i think it gets back to a lot of this i think the biggest reason for people who are hesitant it's the side effects it's worrying about how, the safety because it's quick right we talked about that how quick these were developed and we kind of addressed that this is a new technology and so far there's been no evidence of anything out of the ordinary with that um, this, and trusting the government and stuff, but it's really, it's the side effects thing. And, and I think this gets to this whole anti-vaxxer idea, um, right? There's a, there's a growing population of people. I mean, oh, that's been in the news. Of course, it's tied into this because we're talking about a vaccine who just won't vaccinate, right? And you can go on the CDC's website and it's got a list of all the different outbreaks of these different, I don't call them medieval diseases, but like diseases that were generally gone in the United States 
in the last 40 years that pop up randomly because of there's a percentage of people here or there who don't vaccinate their kids. Um, that's really where it is, or themselves. And according to the CDC, less about 0.5% of Americans identified themselves as being anti-vaccine um, in 20 years ago. In the last five years, that number has tripled to over 1.5%. And it's still, when you're talking about 350 million people, that's a good number of people. And so um, it's usually around vaccines for kids, measles, mumps, rubella, tuberculosis, pertussis, the, the DTaP for diphtheria, um, things like that. And it's, it's all tied back to a 1998 article published by a doctor called Andrew Wakefield in the UK in The Lancet, which is like the UK's number one medical journal, tying vaccination to autism. And that scared a lot of people. It, it literally caused a 50% drop in vaccinations in the UK. Wow. Um, in wow. Lo- specifically in London, but like it was, it was bad for a time. And then since then, to give people a rundown, I mean, that article and his research has been unequivocally completely discredited. It turned out that he had significant financial interests in pushing this anti-vaccine ideology, that he was involved in lawsuits and had stock interests and all kinds of financial stuff. He was being paid by people, basically, to push this agenda. Um, The Governing Council of Doctors in the UK conducted this year-long, years-long, sorry, years-long investigation um, that ended in 2010, where he lost his medical license, he was censured, he was kicked out of the core of doctors in the, Uni- in the United Kingdom. Every single one of his findings was like definitively discredited. Every other doctor that signed on with him admitted what they did and have like you know reproached him. Um, like he's completely and utterly discredited in every way. No, no other study has ever been able to reproduce even one bit of the evidence he did. Um, and there have been numerous studies published throughout the world that discredit the research. So there's, there's literally no danger of autism, and yet it still circulates. I guarantee you there are a lot of people who still draw that connection. I remember hearing that stuff when I was in school, before we went to college, because we had to get certain vaccines to go to college. I remember, oh, my kid's not getting that, or my mom won't let me get it because she's worried about autism. And this was 2005, 2006. Mm-hmm. So it's, I think that, coupled with a lot of this other stuff we're talking about, is what really scares people. No, that makes sense. Well, we need to take a quick break. And so when we come back, stay tuned. We're going to pick up the rest of this conversation on vaccines. And then we're going to get into our inspirational story. And we're going to have a time of devotion in God's word. You are tuned into Jesus and Coffee Time right here on 980 WCAP, the voice of the valley. Everybody gets it. I'm your host, Ashley Elizabeth. Stay tuned. And we are back. You are tuned in to Jesus and Coffee Time right here on 980 WCAP. I'm your host, Ashley Elizabeth. I'm here with my husband, Justin. Still here on the second half. This is exciting. I know. My first overtime. (laughs) I hope I get time and a half. There you go. So we wanted to finish up this conversation about anti-vaxxers. You know, that was kind of what we had been we ended the last segment on, I should say, um, you know, we had talked about vac- vaccinations, the different types of vaccines, the percentages in the U.S. and all the importance of getting vaccinated, all of that. Uh, but now we're talking about the Andrew Wakefield study from 1998 because it still hangs around um, that link to vaccines and, and autism in children. Mm-hmm. But it's been completely dispelled. So, Justin, I'm going to pass the ball back to you to finish sure. that up. Yeah. It just like you said, it's been totally, completely dispelled and discredited in every possible way over the past 15 years. But it still hangs around, as things like that often do, because it's sensational. It's an easy answer to a complex problem. Um, and it, it's, it, it still gets pushed. It still gets pushed. Nobody talks about all the stuff that happened to him afterwards. It's not, you know, as news outlets are reporting the autism thing, because they still talk about it. I know they do. Nobody's also saying, oh, by the way, you know, every medical expert in the world, including the people who supervised him and all the doctors he worked with, said he's, he's totally wrong and nobody can reproduce the results. And he had blatant financial conflicts of interest and he was set to make an enormous amount of money if his study was published and so on and so forth. Nobody talks about that. So it's, it's an information asymmetry. It's a gap. It's like everything else that we talked about so far. There's just a gap in information. So it leads people, and it's through no fault of their own because they're working with what they have, to make certain conclusions. I'm curious, Mm -hmm. where is Andrew Wakefield now? Well, like I said, um, he lost his medical license in the UK. He's been expelled from the college. They they call it like the College of Doctors over there. Um, And he moved to the US, I think 
in 2004, while all this was ongoing, all the investigations. And he lives in Texas now, and he's one of the leading anti-vaccination people in the country, um, pushing all kinds of theories about stuff. Again, like with absolutely no scientific evidence, absolutely no studies, but he, he banks on this reputation that he developed in 19, from his 1998 study and that a lot of people just aren't aware of of what the subsequent events to as his reputation to push his agenda, which I'm sure, like this study, has, it has to be financial. It's, it's right. Follow the money. It's always money. That's so, true. Well, so he, money is the root of all evil. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So he's joined the pantheon of, of people who continue to push these theories. Okay. Well, wrapping up our section on vaccines in general, mm-hmm. is there anything else that you want to kind of share, Justin, about this? Just quickly, um, we talked about the rollout, like where things stand now and how they look in the future. Uh, when the U.S. started vaccinating people in December, the goal was 20 million people in the month. We did about five. The reason for that was um, the federal government, their plan was literally to buy a lot of vaccine and fund a lot of vaccine, which was great, which was smart. And we had a lot at the time, a good amount, but they literally were just going to drop it off to states and let private groups, pharmacies, doctors handle the logistics. But Was this under the... The former the administration, because this was okay. before, the, this was after the election, but before the transition, right? Um, but as we've seen throughout history, not only just recently, but throughout history, like relying on the private sector to do what government needs to do, some nationwide thing, it doesn't work. They just don't have the resources. You think about it this way. The richest people in the United States, uh, it's either going to be the guy who owns Amazon or Elon Musk, the guy who owns Tesla, right? Bezos or Musk. They compete, whatever. Between the two of them, they're worth collectively like $250 billion, right? That isn't, that's a quarter. No, I'm sorry. That's a third of the amount of money the government spends on the military every year. Wow. That's their collective worth if you took all their money, right? So even if they spent all their money, it's not enough. Like even if all private got together, you know what I mean? Like it's only the government has the resources and and we've seen that throughout this COVID thing, this whole idea that government needs to be small, small government and, and not that government needs to be huge. And I get it. Bureaucracy can be ridiculous. Anybody who's tried to go to a DMV, right, has, <laughs> has that issue. True. I get that. True. But at the same time, like government still has a role and it needs to be big enough and strong enough to deal with issues like this, right? The testing rollout was a di- for COVID was a disaster. The rollout of guidelines for what to do about COVID was a disaster. And hundreds of mil- thousands of people in the U.S. died because it was so disastrous. And this was no different. It's, this was the same playbook. It was, let's just leave it up to the states. And the states aren't equipped to do that. In, you know, they're just not. So to, a long story short, they were just going to leave a lot of vaccines at the airport and let states figure it out. When the new administration came in, they put the National Guard behind it. They put FEMA behind it. FEMA set up several hundred vaccination centers throughout the country. And in, you know, like I said, his goal, President Biden's goal was 100 million vaccines in 100 days. And they did over 100 million in something like 58 days. So now he's trying to get 200 million in 100 days. I remember, literally remember media people laughing at him at his first press conference when he said, this is the goal, because they couldn't conceive of it. You know, and again, this is me speaking personally, but I, because I think they were just too used to seeing the incompetence of the last four years with everything that they couldn't, people kind of forgot that, oh yeah, government can work if you actually try. Well, this is the result. We're seeing the U.S. vaccinate, right? A quarter of all vaccinations in the world is in the U.S. We're vaccinating, we're getting to 3 million people a day. We're out, it, the only reason we're not number one in everything is because we have such a big population. And this is all, and this is all done in what? Two months. And so what you're seeing is a concerted effort by government to solve a problem. And this, this is good governance. Other stuff, there are other issues, whatever, we can debate that. But you're, you're, this is undeniably, factually, objectively, good governance in action, the COVID rollout of the vaccines, right? And so that means by May, you and I, who are young, thank God, and healthy, thank God, and have no underlying conditions, thank God, can sure. get a vaccine when the projection was July, August, nobody knew. That's a big difference. And I'll tell you, I'm looking forward to getting mine because I, first of all, I want to do my part. I think it's important. I want to see this eradicated everywhere. Mm-hmm. I don't want to see anybody get sick. I've seen too many people have relatives who have gotten really sick or are still dealing with repercussions months and months later from the disease and just how it's affecting their body and their organs, people with heart issues, people died. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, we, mm-hmm. we've seen a lot. And so, you know, I'm looking forward to getting inoculated. I really am. Me and, too. 
I want to see life get back to some type of new normal. I want to be able to go out to eat with my friends and and not feel like I'm constantly like looking over my shoulder. I mean, how long has it been? It's been what a year since over we've, a year since we've sat in a restaurant and shared mm-hmm. a meal our, ourselves or even with anybody. Yeah, with, with anything. Right. So I'm I'm looking forward to that, and and so I can say, you know, I know for us, and I, I know I speak for you too, that mm-hmm. we're definitely going to get ours as soon as we can. A hundred percent. And so you know, I would encourage everybody, obviously, make the best decision for you, but also keep others in mind as well. You know, we need to eradicate this. And it's been proven through history that, you know, through vaccinations, it works when enough people get vaccinated. Oh, of course. I I mean, up up until the 1950s, like tens of thousands of kids died or were maimed every year from stuff I was talking about. Measles, mumps, rubella, polio, um, tuberculosis, pertussis, which is whooping cough, diphtheria, and things of that nature until these vaccines were invented and administered on a wide scale. And then it virtually disappeared until the late 1970s when the anti-vaccine movement started to come up in bits and pieces and so on and so forth. And so it's kind of like reliving, right, something from the past because, you know, there's a lot of people, younger people these days don't know what it's like to grow up with the danger of those diseases around them. Right. But if you ask your parents, I know even mm. we've had that conversation. We oh, just yeah. talked to your parents. My in-laws, we had this conversation the other day about that, and they remember some of those things. They were talking about, was it the tuberculosis shot that leaves yeah. like an imprint? Yeah. Or, or used to leave an imprint in the skin? A and, bump on the skin. Yeah, things like that. And they grew up with people who had kids who had polio. Right. And we, it's severely debilitating. Nobody, I, I guarantee, a lot of people today don't even know what that is. Being in our 30s. People our age have no idea. We don't understand that. That's true. I mean, it seems like we're well on our way to eradicate this thing. And, you know, with that said, there's a lot to cover with vaccines. So we're going to turn this into an hour long vaccine special this week. So listen, everybody, you're going to have to tune in next Tuesday at 10 a.m. right here on 980 WCAP to catch the inspirational story and the time of devotion in God's word. So we're going to just continue with this topic. Um, So, Justin, let's talk about variants, because Mm -hmm. I know, you know, variants are a very scary thing. We've seen some pop up in some other places and we're seeing them here in the U.S., Um, I know there's been some talks even about boosters. Mm -hmm. So for those who have already been vaccinated, needing maybe a booster down the line to protect. So let's get into that topic. Sure. And you're right. Um, Variants, this really takes us into kind of like where we're at now, because everything I talked about is true. Like logistically right now, like between the federal government and the states, they're doing some amazing things with getting the rollout really fast. But as I think we alluded to earlier, it's a race. It's a battle because there's still four, five out of every six Americans still hasn't gotten any kind of shot at all, right? Because that 120 million isn't fully vaccinated people. It's has gotten at least one shot. So there's still a lot of people who have got nothing, right? And we, it's COVID's still around. I know the numbers were dropping, right? And, and that was wonderful. Well, well, the other thing too is we've seen a lot of states here in the U.S. who have pulled their mask bans. Mm-hmm. So there's no more mask mandate. Right. Um, we're seeing increase of number of people in stores. We just went shopping the other day and, and oh, TJ gosh. Maxx was packed out. It was literally like the line was incredibly long. Right. It was bizarre. So, so if everybody just starts going back to the, the normal way of life, naturally, mm. if they haven't been vaccinated, we're going to see an increase in a few weeks. That's, For sure. We, we could see a whole nother spike. And then the numbers are starting to bear that out in the U.S. Um, the numbers were falling, right? They've been falling for uh, several weeks, which is great. Hospitalizations, deaths, infections. But the infections have kind of plateaued around 50,000, which compared to what they were, sounds like nothing. But really, um, that that was like when, when last summer when things were really bad during the summer and the spikes down south and in Texas. We reached the 50,000 and the 60,000, and that was way worse than in April. We're still there. Like, that's not like it's gone. We're still there. And it's starting to grow in places like Michigan is now a a spike. New York State, specifically New York City, spike. The Northeast area, so Massachusetts, Rhode Island, not so much Maine, but like here, New Jersey, Delaware, places like that. Um, Still down south, Florida, the southern states like Tennessee and Alabama, a bit like in Texas and a few of the Midwestern states. And all, there's 19 states that are starting to see the similar types of increases that presaged a spike again. Now, is this variance? That's, yes. So that's, well, that's I'm, what, I'm just trying to figure out exactly what's causing the spike. Because, right. again, we are seeing a lift in mandates. We are. And it hasn't been, according again, this is according to the doctors, it hasn't been quite long enough to attribute these number increases specifically to the lifting of mandates. Because in the past, when mandates were lifted, you it took four plus weeks to start to see the cases go up. And then a few weeks after that, infections and then people in hospitals. 
So it's too quick. So they are attributing this mostly to the variants. And variants, for, for just so people know what we're talking about, these are different strains of COVID, right? When COVID started, it was one strain. Now there's multiples. The three specific ones that we're talking about, you talked about they came from different places around the world. I don't know which one of these three came from where, but I can say that one of them came from the UK, one from South Africa, and one from Brazil. And uh, just so people know, one is the B117 variant, the B1351 variant, and the P1 variant. Now what makes these dangerous, specifically the B117, it's the one that's the most prevalent in the US. Uh, I think the last numbers that I saw was that at least 40% of all the cases in New York State are B117 variants. What makes it so dangerous is that it's 50% more transmissible and at least 30% deadlier. And, and that's really, the double whammy of that is really bad. And so um, for people to really understand that, transmissibility means that a 50% increase means instead of, and I'm just using these numbers for Ill illustrative purposes, if in the past 20 out of 100 people would get a virus, obviously doubling the transmissibility means now it's 40 people. And things spread, you know, that, that whole thing, one becomes two, two becomes four, the way that things will grow. Well, yeah, then it becomes pandemic. And the curve and everything. This yeah. is the same kind of thing. I'm not a math person, but this is the same kind of thing. So it's just transmissibility alone, a growth in that, leaving a virus the same level of deadliness is far worse than if the virus was more deadly but transmitted at the, the lower rate. So again, I know it's for math, people who aren't into math, it's kind of difficult to understand, but the, the gist of it is the more transmissible a disease is, that's worse than if it's deadlier. In this case, this, this variant is more transmissible well, well, right. and more deadly. Because that's what we've seen, and that's what this whole COVID-19 thing has been. One person right. went to a party, and all of a sudden, 50 people at the party get it, and then those 50 people go to other parties into their homes, and they infect, and then you right. see hundreds and hundreds and thousands, and it just grows. And so it, it, it as much as we try to stay masked, and you're, you're right, people, uh, states are lowering their thresholds they're letting they're opening restaurants and all those things and i know it's it's people are happy to see that but with these variants around being more transmissible being more deadly um they they do blunt the effectiveness of the vaccines a bit um maybe not a ton but enough between not a lot of people having the vaccines yet despite how well everything's going and the lowering of the mandates and people just being fatigued with all these different rules and you can't blame them that's why things are starting to go up. And so there's a danger of another spike. It's still too soon to tell here. Tellingly, though, in Europe, which has done, honestly, a poor job of rolling out their vaccines, their population's bigger than the U.S. There are over 400 million people um, collectively in Europe. And they have, you know, the similar type of vaccines that we do, as well as the AstraZeneca and other ones, like I said before. They haven't done nearly as much as the U.S. has collectively. And they're starting to see severe spikes again. Um, and like I know for a fact that Italy is going back into lockdown for several weeks over the um, Easter holiday and, and after because they've seen such an enormous spike in cases that they point directly to the variants. They haven't done enough vaccines to start affecting that. They lifted their mandates. And it's, it's just the kind of the perfect storm. And it's other places in Europe are starting to see this too. So when you want to compare the rollout, you want to compare how well the government's done, you want to see what starting to vaccinate a population does in terms of how sick people will still get versus not like you don't see a spike in Israel. You don't see a spike in Chile. You don't see a spike in the UAE and, or even in the UK because they're starting to vaccinate enough people that they're winning the race against the variants. Um, in Europe at, at large, they're losing right now. They need to pick the pace up. Um, so where do we stand? Where do we, where it's kind of like, well, like I said, 19 states are starting to see increases. The numbers that were going down and down and down and down have plateaued in the 50,000s. And this isn't to scare people. It's just these are the numbers. And so scientists are saying, we'll know in the next two to three weeks. If we start to see more growth in these numbers, it means the variants are starting to win, despite how well we're doing. And it just shows you how dangerous COVID is. But if they stay where they are, or they start to decline again as more and more people get vaccinated because the numbers have continued to grow and continue to grow then we know that we're winning and we won't see another spike. I'm hope obviously, I, I'm sure everyone's hoping no more spikes, but there is a distinct possibility. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I, I pray that that's the case. Definitely. And I hope that a lot of people do choose to get vaccinated. And, you know, I, I hope that, 
even what we've talked about this morning, that this hour, this special hour, hmm. to talk about the vaccine and COVID and the current state of affairs um, will really help people. I do. I want to talk for a little bit about the church. Sure. And because we talked about, you know, the numbers, about how many, the percentage. Can you can you run us back through that real quick? Sure. Um, it was 38% of people who identified as white and evangelical Christian. And, and so... The way those numbers were explained in the studies was um, an evangelical is like a kind of charismatic Protestant, uh, Southern Baptist, and of that nature. Um, the, the definitions were always different, but that was the way the study, the poll had defined it. So it's about 25 to 30 million people yes. within that group that are saying, I'm not going to get vaccinated. Right. I want to talk about the separation of science and the church, mm -hmm. because I think as we're talking here... I think that's a large part of this. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, God did create science. Oh, sure. And we do know, too, that over time things evolve. Yes. Right? Yes. Did God create every person very specific and unique? And did God create every animal? Of course. But over time, we do adapt. We do. And there's a level of science in that, right? It's that whole creationism versus, um, what's the word? Evolution? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good thing this isn't Jeopardy this morning. I need more coffee here. But the, the point is... Even vac vaccines, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yes, it's a scientific advancement, but it's it's important. And I think that a large part of the population in the church just kind of says no to anything that comes out of science. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm explaining this right. It does. It does. And the historical record would back you up. Um, I know we don't have a ton of time, so it's not something to really get into. I know we talked about this briefly, our uh, episode a few weeks back, our broadcast about climate change, the same kind of thing. Um Historically, the church in the United States has fluctuated between these pro-science and anti-science, pro-reason and, for lack of a better word, anti-reason kind of attitudes. And the past hundred years or so has kind of fallen again into this kind of, like you said, like to some degree, rejection of science. It's not all Christians, certainly, and it's not a majority, but it's a decent percentage we're seeing with this. They just won't take the vaccine under any circumstances for whatever reason, and we know the reasons, the side effects, the prevalence of this autism in kids thing, um, the whole, like, do, they don't trust the government, they don't trust the experts. Well, I've even heard, and this is a very small percentage, but, well, there's, you know, there's a microchip in it, and this is right. the mark of the beast. And if you read the book of Revelation, regardless of when you think the rapture is going to happen, and there's this debate amongst Christians about whether the rapture will happen, you know, before, during, or after the Great Tribulation, we know that the mark of the beast doesn't come until about halfway through the tribulation, and the tribulation doesn't start until the Antichrist comes and is revealed, and the beast comes and is revealed. And honestly, we haven't seen any of that yet. And so really, it's just creating fear and and a false, you know, it's, it's a false statement right really is what we're seeing it it speaks to emotion right again it speaks to the flesh like that's i know it's a heavy thing to say to a christian but like that that's this kind of thing this kind of thinking the autism thing and it gets gets you worked up it speaks to the flesh it speaks to your emotions it gets you you know riled up and 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 it it's but it's not the cold calculating reasonable scientific thing and we talked about it before you can reconcile this stuff. You can say God created man, but he created man is a creature that can evolve, that can grow, that can change by his environment, by time, by whatever, right? We And the animals, the natural world, the same way. There's no, you know, me personally, and I, I think, again, my opinion, but I think this is true, that we understand the depth and the beauty and the majesty of creation through science. Science is the means by which we can understand right at least to our the to our capacity the incredible depth of what god created like i know i can't pinpoint the exact verse right now but i know somewhere in the bible it says like the stars sing and i know recently uh, scientists were able to use some type of telescope to record the sounds of stars stars create vibrations and they make sound and even though space is a vacuum they were able to record the sound and so that correlates. And there's geographic, I'm sorry, geological evidence to support Noah's flood. And there's a lot when you go back um, that you can find scientifically to support the things that you read about in the Bible. So again, like for, I know we talked about this before, but just to reiterate, you can easily reconcile the two. But it's, it's not, that's not done a lot for a lot of people these days. 
the scripture you're referencing, one of them is in Job 38, 7. New King James says, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Hmm. So all the stars singing in a chorus. Yeah. And <laughs> Beautiful. This, you can find it online. <laughs> yeah. Scientists at NASA were able to record that. So all that to say, those things can be reconciled. But you're right. There's an undercurrent of that. Well, even um, healing, hmm. right? Healing can come. We know Jesus is a healer. Come on, somebody. Can I get an amen this amen. morning? Amen. Jesus is still in the healing business, right? But does the healing come in an instant where maybe you're in a service and, you know, you're crying out to the Lord and bam, you're healed? Yes, that can happen. Sure. Or can healing come through, you go, you know, to the, the hospital and they do a test on your body and they're able to pinpoint, you know, what's plaguing you, what's going on, and then you have a surgery and you're healed through that surgery. Right. Well, you're still healed and God used the doctors and the hospital and the procedure and those advancements to bring about to bring about your healing, mm-hmm. right? So I even think about it that way. You know, there are some people who um, will say, well, I feel like I got a healing, so I'm going to stop taking my medication, right? And I always say, well, wait a minute, you know, talk to your doctor, right? you know, make sure. And, and you know, because even medication, I believe that that's from God. You know, I don't believe in over-medicating. I think, you know, a lot of times doctors will do that. They'll throw medication and, and even medication at side effects. And I think there's a mm. line that, you know, kind of needs to be drawn there a bit. Um, but I do believe in medication. Sure, of course. You know, some things come come over time. But I think this whole thing between science and the church can be um, mediated. Yeah, definitely. And th- this vaccine thing is no different. It's just the latest. And because COVID is so prevalent and the COVID vaccines are obviously such a big deal because it's really, it's, it's the vehicle by which the pandemic is going to go. I mean, for all that, we're going to, the herd immunity ideas, you know, you know, this idea that herd immunity, we can get there by just allowing a lot of people to get sick. It was really pushed, you know, the last year or so by certain segments. It doesn't work. People just die. You get herd immunity by vaccinating people and and allowing enough people to have an immunity where it dies out like we did with measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. And we did with the pertussis vaccine and the other things that we were talking, polio, the stuff we were talking about before. That's herd immunity. This is the way it's going to go away. And so, you know, I hope that people, at least people listening to this broadcast or other things out there where they find the facts, they'll think about it and they'll see, you know, the cost benefit analysis. Oh, maybe I'll get a headache. Maybe I'll feel fatigued for a few days. Maybe I'll have some soreness. But like you said before, the danger of COVID, it's not, well, I'll get sick and it'll pass. For a lot of people, yeah. But there's still somewhere, like I, I want the last statistic I saw was one out of every 11 people has some type of long term, often chronic. A condition from a COVID infection. Well, I know a 25 year old who contracted COVID. Her stepfather got it, brought it home. She got it. The stepfather was fine. And so was her mother. They had mild symptoms. And actually, she had mild symptoms. So she wasn't hospitalized or anything. And then um, now has actually had to have four heart surgeries because what happened with the the aftermath of how COVID affected her body, her blood was so thick, hmm. it caused a clot in her heart and she's had to have four procedures. Terrible. And she was healthy. There was no underlying, you know, medical issues. And at the time, it's not like she had to be hospitalized. So the point is, it's, it's, it's not a joke. You know, this is a real thing. It's not the flu. Herd immunity does not work. Um, And these vaccines really are a godsend and praise the Lord that they came out as quick as they did. And Mm. I'm thankful for this new technology that we talked about. I didn't even know all of that information. So thank you, Justin. Sure for enlightening me in that area as well. Well, friends, our time this morning went by fast, but it's coming to a close. Um, I want to thank you for tuning in to this one-hour vaccine special that we had this morning. You know, I really hope that you got something good out of it. If you ever have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to us. Ashley at AshleyElizabeth.com is my email. Again, Ashley at AshleyElizabeth.com. You can come and join me every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. right here on 980 WCAP voice of the valley where everybody gets it um, for an inspirational hour normally we have our first segment on the national news we apply a biblical perspective to it we give you the facts and then we come back from our commercial break we have an inspirational story and a time of devotion in god's word so come and join us next week all right friends we're going to end with what we always end with we are blessed to be blessings and you may be the only jesus someone sees today so represent him well god bless and we'll see you next tuesday 